How you doing, Steve? I'm doing good. Yeah. So can you tell us just a little bit about, um, you know, um, the way that you lived before you met Jesus? Just anything that comes to mind um, that would illustrate your life before you came to know Jesus. I want to say I grew up in church, but really I didn't. I did go to church with my aunt a lot of times. It was a Methodist church, which I'm not really into Methodists because of the way their program is and their belief. I was never into into it. I went to a few, a lot of churches to find the right church, and I just couldn't find it. So that happened when you were a child or a teenager. Um. No, basically, teenage years, I was, I was a troublemaker, basically. All right. All right. And just wanted to see what I could get away with when I was a teenager, mm -hmm. a lot. Did that trouble boy behavior follow you into adulthood? A little bit, yeah. Tell me about your adult life when you lived away from Jesus? Mm. I was still into shoplifting a lot. Um, used to steal cigarettes for a little while from my wife until I got caught. But <laughs> my stupid thinking, I, I was thinking, I at least got away with it for about a month before I got caught. <laughs> and I was kind of proud of that in a way. But I went to jail for 90 days for it. <laughs> and I, I stopped after that. And uh, I had problems with my first wife. Not getting along very good. And it took a while. I was probably in my 40s, maybe, before I actually found God. Did it took a while. So your actions um, did come into your adult life. How did you cope with um, difficulties in life? Difficulties in life? Like, like how? When you were maybe in jail or when you were shoplifting and things would happen, who did you turn to? Or what did you turn to? Hmm. <laughs> I'm not for sure how to answer that. Um, I don't know. A lot of it was because of my drinking drinking alcohol, a lot of it, and just seeing what I could get away with. And I did, even did that when I was younger, too, when I was in high school and middle school. Um, my dad would give me money, about $25 a week, but even though I had the money to buy stuff, I guess I'd still go with if I could get away with it. It's like my cassette collection. It was mostly stolen cassettes. Just to see if I'd get away with it. And I did for the longest time. And I got to where I was proud and I didn't care. Proud that you could, could, could do that. And get away with it. Yeah, and get away with it. So you call yourself sometimes Walmart Steve. What does what does that mean? I was a whole side holder at Walmart and just trying to get money off off people to to live because I was homeless, didn't have a place to live okay. until I had enough money to get a motel room 
and I'd stay there. Talk to me about that time. What was going through your head and your heart during that time? Uh, I had a buddy that helped me out. Well, he said he helped me out. I'm not for sure if he actually did. But he helped me out with the warrants that I had, my, my back warrants that I had. He paid them off for me, supposedly, which I haven't seen any different. So as far as I know, I don't have no warrants now because of it. He paid like ten to $12,000 for me in warrants. And I used that money to pay him back, most of it to pay him back. I didn't, I didn't get much money from it, maybe like $30 from it a day. And he got most, most of the rest of it. What does it feel like to be homeless? Uh, not the greatest. You can't sleep. You're always wondering if you always got to sleep with one eye open. You don't know if anyone's going to come around and take stuff from you, which has happened. <laughs> I've had a lot of stuff taken from me. Um, it's just a scary thought. You don't know where you're going to sleep at. Sometimes in the woods, sometimes in an abandoned house, which then you'll have trespassing issues, which I did. And um, jail time, which I never got, but that can happen. And I got lucky enough to where I, that never happened. They just told me to leave whenever I was trespassing. They just told me to leave and never come back. So. Sounds like somebody was looking out for you. Yeah. I think God was at times. At times he was. Even when you weren't walking with him? Yeah. I just didn't understand it at the time. Who actually was uh, watching me and protected me. At one point, I thought since most of my family's up in heaven, I thought they were watching over me. My grandparents, my mom and dad, I was thinking maybe it was them watching me, watching over me still. But then I found out that it could be God helping me. I went to a men's retreat and found out more about him. And he got in my heart, and I just cried that whole weekend over it. Would you say that that was when you gave your life to the Lord, or was it later? It was then. It was that weekend. Through that weekend a little bit, how God used that weekend and, and what you did in, in your heart? Yeah, it, <clears throat> it grew. It definitely grew. And it just felt good. It was a good feeling. And I felt good for about a week until my second wife got on me about it. She had self-esteem issues and she would always get on me about certain things. And I finally got tired of it and started drinking again. <laughs> Picked up the bottle again. Because of what you wanted me to do. So during those times that you were drinking, were there other things that, that led you away from your newfound life with Jesus? Mm. 
I can't. I can't think of anything. Okay. Right. So alcohol had a pretty significant hold on your life, you would say? Yeah, it did. Okay. So Steve, um, I remember about a year and a half ago when I heard your name for the first time. And that was um, right here at this church. And it was in our Wednesday night refuel service when we were taking prayer requests. And um, Carrie Straley um, had a big burden on his heart for you because he had worked with you previously um, in the workplace and um, he saw you out with your sign and his heart really broke for you. And he knew that the solution for your homelessness, for your drinking was Jesus. And so our small group began praying for you a year and a half ago. And here you are today, sitting in this very church. Can you explain to me, when was it that you hit bottom and you reached out for Jesus? It was probably when, well, it was, <laughs> uh, when me and my second wife got a divorce. And... It was over watching porn movies on computer. She caught me and wondering why I did it because she thought I was really into Jesus too. She thought that and she tried to be a godly woman, but she had issues herself that she couldn't overcome. And after we got a divorce, well, separated for a while. I stayed with her for a while so I could get a, a job. That's when I left German Container for a while. Issues there, um, but <laughs> that's another big story. Um, but um, she did help me with getting an apartment. She did pay for the first month's rent for an apartment for me. And um, I got a job working in Paris at North American Lighting. And I was still drinking. <laughs> um, and I would go into North American Lighting uh, drunk sometimes. And they finally hired me on and I was still drinking. <laughs> um, but I don't know. They wanted me to work uh, Memorial Day weekend. It was mandatory that we worked. And usually on my Memorial Day, I'd drink. And that's what I was doing. And I went in uh, drunk. And they breathalyzed me and found out I was drinking and fired me on the spot. And they told me, well, we don't want you to drive back to Terre Haute. If you do, we'll call the police. So <laughs> I had to call my ex-wife to come pick me up. That was kind of embarrassing. but And she got on me about it, about my drinking and that I should quit. So it got to the point where I couldn't pay the rent anymore. The landlord got on me about it, saying that he he basically evicted me. So at that point, I just, I think I went to a motel room. Either that or I slept in my car. I still had a car. And I slept in my car most of the time, wherever I could, behind shopping mall, stores, wherever I could find a place to hide, hide my car so I could sleep. And I had most of my stuff in my car. I had storage though, for the bigger stuff. 
and I just slept in my car, just drove around, and motels, uh, sometimes friends' houses, but not very often. So I didn't really have too many friends to deal with, and some of them were homeless too, in the same situation as me, so they didn't really have a place. So, I was just driving around, looking for another job. Um, well, afterwards, after I, well, I'll go back a little bit. I, I did forget this. Very important, too. <laughs> um, about a couple of days, after a couple of weeks of kicking myself for losing a good job, good paying job, I kicked myself a lot. And my wife would call me every once in a while and check on me. And finally, I got talked into going to the next step which is a recovery house. And I checked myself in there and I stayed there for eight months. Yeah, it was like eight months. I went through their program and dealt with everything that I needed to do. Went to meetings and Finally, they <clears throat> they let me go to, out to the other house on Borey's that they had, uh, like a, I'm not really for sure what it would be called, um, but it was close to liquor. <laughs> and I thought, hey, let me try and see if I could handle it. And... It didn't work. <laughs> it didn't work. And next step, found out. And then New Year's, I went to a Legion for band for New Year's with a, one of my girlfriends. And they didn't like that either because I wasn't supposed to be around someplace I drank. Even though I was drinking Coke, they still said no. You can't do that. <laughs> and I got in trouble for that. So they finally kicked me out. And then that's when I was in my car again. Basically, that's when I started living in my car, is after Next Step kicked me out. Talk so. to me about um, when you showed up here. What made you come? Um, <clears throat> mm, well, my my friend that was helping out, um, he finally went to jail, and um, I had somewhat of a relief that he wasn't around me anymore to control me, to put me down, um, just making me feel bad, Make, making me hang my head down in shame. I was ashamed of what I was doing, finally. But I'd tell him that. He'd ask me, well, why, why are you always holding your head down? I said, well, I'm ashamed of what I'm doing, for one. He didn't understand that. I couldn't make him understand why I was ashamed of myself. So I started thinking and praying to God. And I remembered what Carrie said about bondage breakers. That was on Friday. And this was on a Friday. And I thought, hey, I'll go check it out and see what it's like. So I left about 4.30 from Walmart, walked up here, and 
Come to find out, they moved to Monday. <laughs> so <laughs> I walked up here, I guess, for nothing <laughs> is the way I looked at it. But Trevor said, no, you didn't because Josh was supposed to be teaching the younger class ministry. And I got to talk to him for a little bit. And they had um, Chick-fil-A chicken. And he asked me if I was hungry. He bought out some chicken for me. And we talked for a while. And he asked me, well, did you want to stay? And I said, well, uh, no, not really. <laughs> um, well, if it was bondage breakers, yes, I could. But he said, well, they moved till Monday. Okay. <laughs> so he gave me a ride back to the motel. I was staying in the motel for, for then, till then. And he gave me a ride back to the motel. And he, he thanked me. And that's when it started. That next Monday, I came to Bondage Breakers and met Trevor. What is Bondage Breakers? It's an addiction ministry to help you with whatever you have, alcohol, food, drugs, whatever addiction, cigarettes, whatever addiction you have. It helps you. So you've restored your life with Jesus. When did that moment happen? Um, probably after, like I said, when my friend went to jail, I could finally do things on my own. It's like I didn't have my ID, my social security card, my birth certificate, and Um, he was supposed to be helping me with the REACH program. He kept on telling me through the program, I don't know how true it was. I found out later on it wasn't true. <laughs> that there was a mental health woman following me around. And that um, if I didn't do right, they would send me to a mental hospital if I didn't do right. And I found out later on that he was lying to me after he went to jail. I called up Mental Health of America, which is another program for homeless people to help get your housing. Mm -hmm. And I told her what happened and she said, no, there's no one following you around. Don't worry about it. And then I found that, found out from my friend's mom. I told her about it, and he said, no. He was lying to you. There's been no one following you around. He was just lying to you the whole time, just to get money off of you. And come to find out, I guess he had my ID and Social Security card all the time <laughs> and never told me about it. I guess he, there was one time I slept underneath the bridge at the river, um, Fairbanks Park. Mm -hmm. And yet, no, I never really got trespassing charges there. But he told me they, they did. <laughs> he lied to me again. I think he went under the bridge one time. I left my wallet on the barrier, and I think he went down there and got it. He was saying the police went down there and got it, but I think he did. And he kept it from me because he, he thought being homeless, so you don't need this stuff. You don't need it being homeless, but in a way you do. <laughs> you, you need it big time. So Mental Health of America helped me get my ID back, my Social Security back, my birth certificate back, I'm working on my driver's license now, and they, they actually asked me questions about my homelessness and everything and said, well, I qualify for an apartment. So they're just waiting on 
apartment for me. So ever since he went to jail, God has been helping me through his situation the whole time. But did it really have to do with him going to jail? Or did it have to do with the way that you've surrendered your life to him? Basically both, maybe. Because I couldn't do anything without, without him. It was like he was the only person that I had in my life. Who do you turn to now that he's gone? God and Trevor. <laughs> God first and then Trevor. Who is Trevor to you? He's a good... What's his title? Pastor Trevor. Okay. Um, he's a good Christian brother to me. Mm -hmm. He's your discipler? Yes. What's a discipler do? Um, get you closer to God. Uh, learn more about the Bible. Um, there for you if you need someone to talk to. Since Jesus has changed your heart, how has your life changed? Uh, some things that that have happened with your ID have there been other ways that God has shown up and changed your life mm. well he's he's also sent me to Odyssey house um, plus stay for now to stay to get sober and they keep me accountable because there's a brother Liza there you gotta blow into every day when you come back so it keeps you accountable if you're drinking it'll tell on you <laughs> if you're drinking so it keeps me accountable and makes me think if I drink, I'm going to lose everything. I'm going to lose my job, I'm going to lose my house that I'm staying in. I'm lose it all. Go to jail. Lose my church family. I'm lose it all. For for nothing. What would you say to someone who's living apart from Jesus? Mm, that Jesus is good. He, he will help you out if you let him. He will, he will be in your heart if you surrender to him and um, to say the sinner's prayer well and Jesus will come to you I think I said that right at least the right one <laughs> that's Basically all I could think of. Steve, thank you so much for just being open and vulnerable today um, in the ways that God has worked through your life. You have an amazing testimony, and we know that Jesus is going to use your life to reach so many others for his kingdom. Thank you. You're welcome.